a, about um, image segmentation or something which is very strongly related to the task of clustering or general clustering of data. And if you want to describe what clustering or segmentation is with kind of one single term, the, or one single sentence, the easiest way would be group similar things. So we have a number of things. This can be pixels in our image. This can be data points in any, in any dimensional space, can be whatever, points in the 2D plane, for example. And we want to group those elements, those objects which are similar. So we are interested in finding or grouping similar things. And for that, we need to have some measure of similarity. And by grouping things which belong together, this can be based on their distance in, for example, in the plane, we may group things as belonging to one thing. And the question is, how can we do good grouping? So let's be more concrete with an example. So what you see here is an, an aerial image, and you see different types of fields here on that image. And the question is now, what are similar regions in here? So if I'm interested, for example, in distinguishing different types of um, fields that I see here or the urban environments down here, I may want to kind of group them together as saying, OK, all this thing is kind of one type of thing. All the green things here, the fields, are kind of one type of thing. And maybe the red thing here is kind of, this is also kind of one type of thing. So what I want to do is I want to kind of group similar regions in this image together. So how <coughs> the result of, a of uh, such segmentation may look like. So this may be the result. So what you see here are those black lines which separate the regions. And then we have kind of the individual colors in those areas. So what this segmentation basically tells me is that all this part here is basically one region. This part is a region. This is one region. This is one region. This is one region. And if you now think about the classification problems, for example, we have been addressing <coughs> two weeks ago, we may say, OK, everything which kind of belongs here to one of those regions is also likely to have one semantic label, like whatever, what kind of plants actually growing there, or if this is urban environment, or if this is field or forest. So by grouping thin things together, we may also say, OK, this is a region of, uniform, of a uniform class, for example. We are not explicitly making this connection with a semantic class, or quite often we don't do that in clustering, but it's about kind of grouping similar things. And so the goal of today is, if you start with this as an input image, how do we end up getting something like this? That's what we are basically want to look into today if you want to describe this lecture with a single sentence. The other things like this image, for example, identifying similar areas. So we have, so here kind of the white lines are the separating lines. So whatever, here are clouds, this is blue sky, this is, gr this is um, Greenland, here we have a lake, and this is whatever, some beach, beach or stone thing, not that well visible in this image. And so this is one region of kind of one type of thing. This is a region of one type of thing. So what we want to do is we just want to group them, those, those elements in the image, or these pixels in this example, but not explicitly taking into account semantic information or class information by saying, for example, this is water or this is grass. This is not what we are doing. So there's no connection, at least in most um, algorithms we are discussing today, to a semantic class. We just want to make this grouping based on similarity. And this similarity function here can, for example, be the intensity values that we have, or the color information that we have. So there's some measure of um, intensity. So clustering is a problem of grouping similar data points and typically represent them with a single token or with a single name or with a single area in our example. So this is kind of one area, this is one area, this is one area. This can be area whatever, one, two, three, four, five, six or something like this. So this can be one of those tokens. So kind of a single name for it, although the name does not need to be connected to any semantic meaning. So it's really just only based on similarity. We group similar things. And instead of whatever one million pixels in our image, we may have just, for example, six different regions of things which look similar. And kind of grouping those things together can simplify a lot of different things. So the first thing is 
if you, let's say, identified some areas we may be interested in, such an aerial image, this technique can allow me to find actually similar things, so which element looks similar to what I've seen before. Or if I want to kind of summarize information, um, or if I want to do a classification task, and you know, I say, okay, group similar things, and I say, okay, let's go back to this example. If I now want to label training data, let's say I have a lot of those images, and I want to use a couple of images to, to generate training data, I can do this clustering and say, okay, all these pixels here belong to one type of field. This is the second type of field. This is exactly the same as this one. So I can very easily click on them and la label such an image as kind of a, and use this clustering as a pre processing step to simplify my life of labeling such an image. So, this isn't clustering or grouping things which are similar, is a task which quite often occurs in if you process images or if you want to. Um, understand images or further process those images, for example, for doing an analysis, an analys an analysis of what I see or um, uh, classification approach. So what can I, for example, also do if I take one of those images that we have here, we want to group them, and if we then perform a classification in this area, I say it was a, it's quite likely that all the labels which are assigned to those pixels should have actually the same label because they are within one class, so I can add additional constraints to my uh, classification problem, for example. And the goal thing, or the, the main difference between the, the clustering approach that we do here and the classification system that we looked into is that this is what is called an unsupervised approach. So it means we do not provide any training data. In the classification setup, a user had to label a certain number of examples for different classes, for example. In this case, could be whatever, forest, farmland, uh, urban environments, but and the user had to provide this labeled training data, and then the approach could learn what does an urban environment look like. It's completely different here. So we are using, we don't want to have training data. So a person labeling what um, what a similarity or what what similar regions is. We typically provide a similarity function, for example, based on intensity values or uh, color values that we have in here, um, but we do not provide any training data. So what can this be used for? One of the things is, for example, background subtraction. If I have those two images over here, and I say the object I'm actually interested in is within this red box. I draw this red box. So we can say, okay, so everything which is outside the red box is supposed to be background information. What looks similar to this background information, I can actually subtract that from the image. So I can actually automatically re remove the background, for example. Just by saying, the user just said, okay, what I'm interested in is in this, in this area, in this region of the image. So the approach knows everything which is outside here um, is background information. And it says, okay, what looks similar to these areas over here? And then kind of all the structure here is removed. It doesn't necessarily need to be a perfect segmentation, although this one is already pretty good in terms of background subtraction. <coughs> So that was our task of what we want to do, group similar things together. So the main question that we have is what makes things similar? So what defines similarity? So if we have two pixels, what makes those two pixels similar? Natural choice could be the intensity value. Or we may say elements, pixels in an area can vary a little bit but over an overall area, the variance should be small. So I want to have kind of areas with uniform or not strongly varying intensity values. This could be an alternative approach. And I need to define this similarity function. And the question is given that we have a similarity function which can compare two different elements, let's say two pixels, how do we actually turn the overall thing into clusters or into individual regions in our image, for example? And there are different techniques that rely on a similarity function that are then used in order to group those. And that's what we are going to discuss. So we assume that we have a similarity function given. For example, in the image, this could be intensity values or difference in intensity values. This describes the similarity. <clears throat> and we are interested in how do we obtain those different um, clusters. So it's a task that we are going to address clear. When we group similar things, we have a similarity function, and the task is now how to generate those groups. It's kind of the main objective for today. We can use this, for example, for segmenting different regions in an image, but it's definitely not limited 
to image segmentation. We can apply clustering with, with arbitrary types of data. So why are we actually interested in clustering? Next question. So why is this relevant? Okay, we can do this background subtraction. That was kind of nice. But what are other applications of what I can do? So the first thing is, as I said, kind of segmentation in image. We want to separate different regions in an image. And that's kind of the most important thing. And that's kind of the main task for today. So we look into, we have this application in mind of segmenting an image. But the techniques that I'm going to present are also kind of more general and can be applied to different types of data. So do you have any idea what other things or what other, another motivation for me could be to apply such a clustering technique? If you want to analyze large amounts of data, you have a lot of images. For which task could such a clustering approach be useful? So consider you have thousands of images and you want to analyze those images. You want to kind of extract the core information out of that and summarize this data for someone else. So by using clustering approaches, you can say, okay, which things are similar? What are similar things that, I, that appear in my data set? And what are kind of the most prominent elements in there? And those are kind of clusters or groups of similarity in my large image collection. So I can use this actually to summarize data. So you kind of see it as a data compression. Of course, it's an approximation, but we can actually use this to summarize data. Other things like if I want to count a certain number of things, so I have certain fields that I have. So how many fields do I have in this aerial image? If I perform the clustering, I find the individual regions. I can say, OK, I at least may not have a perfect counter for the fields that I have, but better than whatever, counting all the things by hand. Ja, klar. Ich habe mal bei der Firma Münster in Echt, das bei das gearbeitet, und haben wir genau sowas. Die EU vergibt ja für gewisse Landwirte verschiedene Subventionen und dann machen die das halt über Satellitenbilder und versucht man halt sozusagen, dass es Raps, dass es Teil des Multikale rauszufiltern und sozusagen Kontrolle zu machen, ob die auch die angegebene Quadratmeterzahl dann. Yeah. So the, the question or the answer was, um, or the comment was actually that we can actually use this for analyzing large scale of aerial images, for example, to check if um, certain funding, for example, given by the European Commission um, to farmers are actually used in an appropriate way to plant, for example, certain types of plants. This is absolutely true. What you use in this context are typically two techniques. So you combine clustering, what we discussed here, together with classification, because you explicitly want to have this information, like this is corn, or this is another type of plant. Um, and kind of having the semantic information is something which comes from the classification approach. But what the clustering does, it actually can group me those fields together and then kind of eliminate some of the noise that I have in my, in my classification process. So it's, you can perfectly use exactly this, but typically um, what people use is a combination of clustering and classification to do that. But it was absolutely right comment. Anything else? Okay, and last but not least, there was one point. So I talked about summarizing data, about counting things. It's also making predictions. So if I know something Let's say I have a good interpretation of what I've seen in two of my images. And I have 500 Im additional images that I want to analyze. I can actually look for areas in my 500 images which are similar to those areas that I've seen in my first two images. And looking for similarities and then make prediction of what I'm kind of likely to see there. Saying if two things or number of data points look different, they may share other properties. For example, I know that a certain type of field, whatever, um, has a certain issue or needs a certain treatment. I have done this analysis on a small number of images, and now I kind of want to 
make a prediction, what about the other 500 or 1,000 images I should need to analyze, what I'm going to expect here. And I can actually use the similarity information um, from the clustering to actually make predictions. Of course, it's just a prediction. The data doesn't need to be perfect or is typically not perfect, but at least it's a prediction. And I would like to look today into uh, a number of different techniques which we can use for clustering or for segmentation tasks. We start with the very simple ones and then get kind of slightly more complicated. So we start with simple, something which is called region growing. So start with a certain pixel, say, simply grow the region around the pixel as long as it looks similar. And then we start with different kind of techniques. Actually, k-means is one of the most famous techniques or most frequently used clustering techniques. Um, you may have heard that already, but we try to kind of introduce k-means um, again. What it basically does, it typically randomly generates a couple of clusters, let's say k clusters or 10 different regions, and then tries to assign pixels to those regions, reassign those regions, kind of an iterative process to actually find the best assignment. Um, and then mean shift clustering in the end, which is one technique which not tries to explicitly identify clusters, but looks for densities of a probability density function over occurrences of data points and tries to find those means and uses them as clusters. But we'll go through that uh, one after the other. So we start with our first approach, something which brings us towards region growing. And so the goal is we want to partition. If you have an image, we want to partition our image into different regions. Um, and the question is, what could be a possible measure of similarity? So one of the things we said already, just the raw intensity values. Just if the intensity value is the same, you can just group them. What are other ways or other things that I may, may use, may exploit? Yeah? Yes, of course. Color is basically the intensity in three different channels, so I could, of course, use also color information as an additional source. Absolutely right. Any other idea what could be, what I may be interested in? Shape, yes, something I have not considered here, but if we look for certain patterns or we now have some background information about the shape, we can definitely exploit that. If we don't have any information about what we see in our image, it's often not that easy to incorporate shape. So if we know something about what we are going to see, for example, we have those aerial images observing farmland, shape matters, and we can expect to see certain shapes. It's absolutely right. We can use this to be targeted to certain applications. If we have no idea what kind of image we get, um, shape is not always too, that easy to integrate, but we can definitely do that. Any other ideas that we could use? So one of the things we may say, we want to have a region which the region is defined by having similar intensity values, at least the variance in those intensity values in a region shouldn't be too large. So we may look into the variance of a region. But the first thing we can do, we can say, okay, we can simply define a threshold on the variance. And we can actually use the tricks of the filters and the convolutions that we discussed to actually compute those values. So the first thing, so G are our intensity, is our intensity value. We can say, okay, we have the intensity value of our image. We subtract from that a smooth version of the intensity values. And if we use a box kernel for that, that's actually the average, so this kind of the mean intensity value in a certain region. I kind of can square this thing, smooth this further, which actually leads us to the variance of something which is very similar to the variance, except kind of of this prefactor of um, the intensity of the, of the variance in a certain region. So by applying those two filters, then simply saying, if this for an area, the threshold is smaller than a certain, than a certain number, um, that's fine, we go for that. So we start with this very small, with a single pixel, and then start growing this pixel as long as this condition is fulfilled. As long as this is smaller than the certain threshold, just a number that I set. This gives me a region, I start kind of growing a region until the variance of this region would, ex would exceed a certain threshold, and I say, okay, I'll stop now here, and simply start a new region. And I con continue this process until the overall image has been grouped into different kind of regions. It's kind of one very simple approach on how I could do that. 
Other things I mean, can, may take into account the gradients I have in my image. So if I have strong gradients, this may be an indicator that, there sh that I should, for example, separate two regions because there's a strong change in the intensity values and the contrast that I have. Also something that we often find. It typically uses a combination, so this computes me the, um, the gradients of my intensity values, and I typically again smooth this over a region. And then what this in the end boils down to, or often boils down to, is the squared gradients that I use in X and Y location, I sum them up divided by the number of pixels, so the number kind of the local area I'm considering. But these are just kind of different, possible different measures that I have, looking how do the gradients change in my image. Other things I could do, I can just assume a certain model for my intensity values. So I say there is, for example, a certain function which tells me how the intensity values should change. You could say they should all should be the same, then I just have a constant function, or I can start with having a certain function or a certain model which describes me what is still one class, one similarity. And I can simply um, define different types of such similarity measures. So these were just examples. And when I do my region growing, um, oops, I actually start um, right ahead. I simply select a random pixel in my image, and then I inspect the neighbors. And as long as the neighbors fulfill this criterion that we have, for example, the variance of the intensity values is smaller than a certain threshold, I simply add that pixel, that neighboring pixel, to my region. I simply continue this process until the condition is not valid anymore for all the neighbors. I say, okay, now I'm done, I stop. And start with taking another pixel which has not been grouped yet and start the grouping process there. With doing that, I actually get a segmentation of my image, grouping similar regions together based on the similarity function that I defined. What's the problem with such an approach? Any ideas what could be, could be critical? In which situation would that work well? In which situation could that be problematic? Yeah. I think the result depends very much on where you start. The results depend on where I start, that is true. So if I, yeah. So because I, if I start with randomly selecting a pixel to start with, yes, I may get different results. I can also find a policy. For example, I always start from the intensity value with the um, lowest intensity value, which is not labeled yet. Then it would be a process which does not depend on a, well, doesn't give me a, a different segmentation all the time. Although the segmentations are often, but I mean, you're definitely right. If, with this algorithm the segmentations can change from one execution of the algorithm to the second execution of the algorithm. What else? So then I simply stop, I draw another random pixel which has not been labeled yet and continue this process. Or I start with one of the with the neighbor that um, violated the threshold and then start a new region there. We're well, seeing this more from a global perspective. So the key problem that we have with this kind of algorithms is that I actually need to have a pretty good model of what I'm expecting to see before. So this threshold, which kind of the variance do I allow? If I have additional noise in my image, or I have some sources of noise in my image, it may get broken up into really weird small regions. So this works kind of okay-ish as long as I have sm only small or no um, violations of, my, of the underlying model. For example, how the intensity values um, are supposed to change within a region or not. And this is kind of, uh, this is kind of the, the most simple technique you can imagine, region growing, um, but it's not that often used because of this problem. So let's say, okay, let's see what we can do better. Can we do better? The next approach I would start is agglomerative clustering, which is a technique which we kind of, kind of, if we want, leave now the idea of having pixels in an image. So these are kind of general data points. And we want to group similar data points. So let's say we have a two dimensional space, X and Y space, and these are our data points. We want to group those which are similar. 
And we start with the assumption we don't know, every, we don't know anything about those pixels, so everything starts as an own, um, as an own cluster. So every, every point here in this space starts as its own small cluster, its own small world. And our goal is then to merge those which are similar. Okay, so every of these black dots is one single cluster. So we have the same number of clusters than data points we originally had. And then we look to those which are actually close to each other, very similar. So these are kind of those blue ones over here. Those are the, the ones which are closest to each other, the most similar one. We say, okay, we have now the found the two most two similar ones. Let's simply merge them into one cluster. So we kind of merge them into one cluster. And we can actually build up a small tree while we are doing that. So these represent to those two selected points, those blue points. And we now combine them. So I can generate a, a new node over here which combines those two. So on this level, so I kind of can grow this tree larger and larger and larger now. That's what actually will happen. And this means that on this level, those two elements are seen as one cluster. All the other points are still their own clusters. Is this step clear in what we have done? We have a large number of individual clusters. These are those black points here. We took those which are closest to each other, those two guys over here, and then I simply merged them. Now let's look, so what are other cluster points which are close to each other? For example, those two over here. You can say, okay, those two are now the closest one to each other. So let's simply merge them. So we, we kind of combine two of them here. And let's continue this process. Now we actually have here the blue cluster. And this point actually is pretty close to this blue cluster. So let's merge this black point here and this blue cluster over there. So we can actually do this assignment and combine them. And then we see here that now the, this, the blue cluster that we had and the single red element over here, this cluster, are now merged into a new cluster. And I kind of continue iterating this process until all clusters are merged. So kind of, I end up having a large tree over here. We are under the top level of the tree, means all points are one single cluster. And the more I kind of move down in that tree, the more clusters I actually obtain. <clears throat> so the question that we haven't answered yet, which we need to answer before we continue here, how do we actually compare the similarity between those? These are two data points. It's kind of clear on how we could do that if we have a similarity function between two data points. Like in this case, this could be the Euclidean distance of the points in the 2D space. But what happens, especially at that point over here, where we want to compare the similarity between the red cluster, uh, the blue cluster, sorry, and the red point. So what's the similarity of this red point to this blue cluster? How could we do that? Huh? Between what? Between which elements? Between, well, the edge of the blue cluster what is the edge of a blue cluster if I have two data points? Um, good question. Yeah, so what, one of the things I can do is I can simply say, I simply compare the red points to all blue points and take the one which is closest to the red point. So that means that one instance of my blue cluster, the, closest, the one which is closest to the red one is the one that I choose. I can, but of course, with the same argument, take also the one which is furthest away. Or I can compute the average location of those points and compute the, the, the distance function. And this is simply up to the designer, up to the user, how we define that similarity. And again, there are different types of ways to do that. Average distance between points, the maximum distance between points, the minimum distance between points. Um, they can also say, I'm actually not interested in um, using the distance between one of the data points. I may represent them by a new virtual element of this cluster and compute the distance to this cluster. Um, these are kind of different ways on how I can actually do that. So now I have that information. I just commit to one. Let's say we take the minimum distance, one of those examples. So I just take the point here, like this is illustrated over here. 
the point which is closest to the red point, which is this one over here, and then this is my minimum distance. And what I end up with getting is actually I'm, basically, I'm combining the different clusters and I get this kind of tree-like structure. It's also called a dendrogram. And what we can see here, so these are the individual whatever indices or coordinates of the data points that I have. What I have here is actually the distance. The distance between the clusters. So um, I start on here. Those two, one and two, were actually those which were closest together. So they are kind of merged over here. Then there was a third point which was pretty close, which is merged now over here. And then I merge two, those two guys, and then maybe those two guys. And I continue this process, I build up this tree. At some point in time, I have, for example, this cluster and this cluster. And at some point in time, I merge those clusters. And I merge those clusters, and the minimum distance of merging them that I needed for merging them was whatever, 0 0.75 or 3, for example. So if I go higher up through that tree, I can see a distance which is increasing, 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 increasing. And the top level, with a distance of 0 0.9, I can actually merge all points into one single cluster. So now I, have, as a user, can now make two decisions. The first thing is, what is the minimum or maximum distance that I want to allow? Or how many clusters do I want to have? And then I simply start here from the top, if I just want to have one cluster, I merge all those points. If I want to have two clusters, I can actually make a cut, a cut over here. Then this would be cluster one and cluster two. Or I go further down, maybe up to this point, where this would be one cluster, this is one cluster, and this is one cluster. Then I have three clusters. Or I can say, I want to merge everything which is um, closer to each other than 0 0.4. Everything else should stay the same. Then I go to 0 0.4 make the cut over here and would end up in one, two, three, four, five, six different clusters. So with, with kind of pathing through this diagram, I can actually quite intuitively um, either say I want to have n clusters or k clusters, or I want to have a certain distance which I want to say should be the minimum or the Groups shouldn't be merged if their distance is larger than a certain threshold. And this is exactly this threshold that I can actually see here. So it's kind of the idea of agglomerative clustering, clear how that works. Okay. That's good because it's a quite frequently used techniques and there are several reasons. The first reason, it's very, very easy to implement. It's, it's, we just need to have similar, similarity measure between points or our, our clusters, and I kind of need to build up this tree structure. Something from the implementation point of view um, is very easy. The other thing is I don't need to care about any sh which kind of shapes those clusters have. The clusters simply grow as new data points come in. I don't need to take care of that. And it also provides me kind of a hierarchy of clusters. How are different clusters combined and merged into a, into a larger hierarchy? And something which is quite useful and may also help me to understand what's going on in my underlying process. So for analyzing this data, this can be actually useful. However, the technique also has some disadvantages. One of the things could be that, or is all things that actually those clusters, depending on the order in which I merge them, so slight variation in those points may lead to a completely different ordering in how I actually merge my clusters. So for example, if I have <coughs> data points, let's say in a 1D space, more or less equally spaced. I could kind of group those two together, or those two, or those two, or those two. And if I now make slight variations in those points, we're just shifting them a little bit to the right or the left hand side, the order completely changes. So just by small variations, I still may get completely different clusters and also very imbalanced clusters that, for example, grows from here to here and every time just one single element is added. Depends on how I start or how my distance function, or my similarity function is defined. This is kind of the average distance or is it the minimum distance? Especially if I use minimum distance, I may get those imbalanced clusters. Um, yeah, again, the hierarchy may not, mean, may not be too meaningful, so sometimes this is somewhat overrated, this 
basically depends on how good I actually define my, um, my similarity function in order to, if this um, hierarchy is actually meaningful or not. But it's kind of one of the simplest clustering algorithms which works on arbitrary data. And if I want to group things, that's one way to start with it. Okay, so we started with an image with region drawing. We looked to agglomerative clustering, tried to do that in a more general way. Now we are moving back to our image and look to another segmentation technique on how to generate similar, similar regions as an alternative. This is called water, watershed segmentation, also one very, very frequently used technique and also available since, whatever, 30 years or maybe, maybe even longer, I, I don't know exactly. So the idea is, let's say you have, you can see your intensity values that you have as, um, as mountains. So higher intensity values are higher mountains. Now let, let's let some rain, pouring rain on our mountains and then the water runs down the mountains into the valleys. And those valleys basically fill up with water. And the question is, in which of those valleys is the water actually going down and where's kind of, where do they, is the water being collected? And these are those, the kind of the idea of the watershed segmentation is that they kind of start, or start growing the water and I basically want to find those basins of water. And these, if, if, kind of the, that's where the name actually comes from. And these defines my clusters. So you can see this as intensity values. I start with my intensity values and kind of increasing the level of water, which basically means increasing the intensity values that I'm actually considering um, until I find those watersheds. So let's look to how this, let's say this is my continuous function of intensity values. So all the blue points over here are actually maxima in my intensity values. These are kind of the bright points. And the red ones are the minima that I have. And the green ones here are settle points. So if I kind of connect this settle point over here towards the maximum, this is actually one of the segmentation boundaries of the watershed. So if it rains, one water falls on this side. The other, the raindrops behind this uh, yellow fence, so to say, goes to the other side. And this defines me the different regions of my image if those things are the intensity values. So <clears throat> and this, the nice thing is if we, if we kind of take this analogy of water, we can also say at all the kind of um, valleys, the sinks, the, the, the red points, we start and we kind of flood our landscape with water. Whenever water of two valleys actually meets, this gives us our separating line. And this is kind of also the algorithm that I can actually formulate in order to do that. <clears throat> so I start with the, with the local minima, with all the local minima, so all those red points, which are local minima in my intensity function. And every of those points gets a different label. Let's say I number them, simply 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then what I want to do is I want to actually want to kind of start filling up my landscape with water. So I start with those which are very, very low on my landscape. So I take the points and add all the neighbors that we have to what is called a priority queue. So priority is something you should know from Dijkstra's algorithm, for example, from uh, geoinformation systems. Um, this is a data structure where I can simply add elements and I always remove the element which is the smallest one under a certain function. And here this kind of priority is simply the intensity value. So I just add all the neighbors to this priority queue and then if I take out the first element is the element with the smallest intensity value. So kind of adding all neighbors and then I start processing those with the smallest intensity because these are those which are kind of uh, the deepest points in my landscape. So it's clear what a priority queue is, or should I explain that again? Is it clear? Okay. <coughs> <coughs> so what I then do is, after I added all the neighbors to the priority queue, I actually take out <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the pixel with the top priority queue. So in our case, this is the point with the smallest intensity value. So one is the smallest priority. So and then I look to 
all the labeled neighbors of this point, one which I've taken out, and if, if they all have the same label, those which are labeled, it means I'm just kind of extending, like I'm extending this local region. I'm kind of filling up a valley with water. If this is, however, not the case, if the point has the pixel as some of the points which have whatever label number one and others have label number two, that means they're coming from the kind of on a mountain on two sides of the valley. And this is a point where they exactly meet. And this is actually a point which is then a separating point in this watershed segmentation. Now simply repeat this process until the um, uh, priority queue is basically empty. I processed all points. And this is something which you can actually use in MATLAB with the watershed segmentation. You just say watershed, input an image, you actually get this watershed segmentation. And this is how this, for example, looks like. So this is an image which you have seen was one of those aerial images that we used for um, the data associations that we looked into. And if I apply the water segmentation, I actually get this type of segmentation in here. So you see some of those regions which are quite homogeneous are quite large, but I have a large number of very small regions over here. This is just because, I've, for example, here a lot of cars in there on dark surfaces it gives me a lot of small regions. And general, in general, water, the watershed approach tends to over-segment the image compared to what we as a human would do if we should label similar regions, for example. But this is a typical result. So this was um, kind of the so-called flooding algorithm. You can also, there are different types of algorithms on how the watershed segmentation is obtained. And one way how this is often done is actually done based on the gradient image. So this is um, an example image. So this is probably the most frequently used image in image analysis, one of those test images um, for testing compression algorithm segmentation. Um, we can generate the gradient image and then we can actually compute this watershed segmentation on this gradient image. And then we get something like this, which is kind of surprising. Because we get a large number of small areas, you can simply roughly identify the shape. So this is the head, this was the face, um, whatever that was, a mirror over here. Um, so these are the watershed boundaries. And the reason why I get this kind of very, very strong um, over-segmentation is that I have small noise in these gradient images, just small gradients, which give me this very, very fine grain structure. So what I need to do, I actually need to do a further smoothing of that or, or instead um, apply a median filter over this image, over the gradient image. And if I do this, so if I apply this um, median filter, then the segmentation changes. So this is the original segmentation, just kind of the zoomed in view of what I have seen here. And if I apply the median filter over this image, actually the, um, although you, you just see a small difference in this image over here, you see a large, um, or larger um, segments um, in, my, in my output image. Again, just from the segments without any color information, it's quite hard to, to actually identify the, 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 uh, the face of the person, but this is also not intended. It's just kind of the similar looking regions um, in which the approach segmented this image to. But depending on what I do is that I may not be very happy with ty this type of segmentation if I consider the original image. So especially if I consider to the example we had in the beginning with this landscape separated into these nice classes or the aerial, uh, the, the satellite image that we considered, actually this segmentation would be too fine-grained and would be clearly an over-segmentation of my image. So I may not be too happy with this type of result. Nevertheless, watershed segmentation is a very popularly used segmentation approach, especially if I'm later on maybe merging or have a, have a second process which takes some additional information like clustering information into account in order to merge similar regions. So in situations where an over-segmentation is not too critical or a certain over-segmentation, that's still a quite frequently used technique to do this segmentation. So are there any questions up to that point so far? So what we've seen so far is we started with the rather intuitive algorithms. We started with region growing kind of start with a random pixel and kind of grow the region of that pixel in a way that whenever the, the neighbors are similar, we kind of group them into kind of one region. That's how we started. Then we have seen the watershed segmentation, which is a little bit similar, but I'm kind of growing multiple regions in parallel. 
vectors. So starting with all these local minima in my landscape, and I kind of grow them one after the other until these regions meet. Still, it's a kind of a certain form of region growing, at least in the algorithm which I presented. And then when two regions meet, I actually say this is a boundary between those regions. Or the third approach, which is also a very easy to implement approach, is agglomerative clustering, where I say kind of, I'm not considering the image per se as it is. I'm just taking general points, data points in an arbitrary dimensional space. So it can also be pixels, of course. And then I just group them based on pairwise distance. And I kind of build up this tree, which tells me which of the clusters I merge. So I start with a large number of clusters for every data point, and then I successively merge them, or iteratively merge them, until I build up my tree, and then I can select in my tree when to stop. So these are different, so far rather simple techniques, which can be used in order to group similar things together. If I do that based on images and taking into account the local shape, this is typically something which is called segmentation, because I'm segmenting my image. But kind of if I look to the problem of looking to, into general data points in a high potentially high-dimensional space, this is something which is often referred to clustering. But these two problems are very, 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 very related. Is there any question up to that point? If this is not the case, make a five-minute break here, and then we are going to continue with k-means clustering. Thank you.